Hello, and welcome to episode 53 of the Naked Eye podcast. This is Nathan Oxenfeld. I'm very excited to be joined today for today's episode by Orit Kruglansky. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I just wanted to have a chance to have you on, introduce you to, uh, to the listeners, and definitely talk about your new book today. Uh, so for people who, who haven't met Orit before, Orit Kruglansky is a vision educator based in Barcelona, Spain. She's the author of the, the new book. It's an illustrated Bates children's book called I See Clearly. And it was just released in English because uh, she released it in Spanish last year, I believe, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so it, that was titled uh, Veo Bien, right? In Veo Spanish. Bien. Nice. Yes. And, uh, and so now it's in English and people can now uh, get access to it online. People can uh, learn more about Orit and her work uh, at her main website, oritojos.com, or check out the book at icclearly.org. So really excited to, uh, to, talk to talk to you about the book today and some of the topics, uh, the inspiration that went into creating the book and your experience uh, with, with your own vision. I had the pleasure of, uh, of guest reading the uh, Better Eyesight magazine with you from this month, the August 1921 edition, which was all about schools and school children. So uh, if listeners to this show have not heard the Better Eyesight podcast yet, definitely go check that out. We're, we're just doing a deep dive on Dr. Bates's original publications and magazines that came out 100 years ago. And uh, I remember you mentioning when we were having some discussions about those Better Eyesight articles, that those were actually part of the inspiration for you to, to create this, this Bates picture book that, that you put out uh, because of all these stories of children, uh, you know, getting help from the Bates method as well. So um, do you want to take a moment to just sort of introduce yourself in your own words and, and kind of go into that a little bit about about this new uh, contribution that you're sharing with the world in your new book here? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I, I found the Bates Method after 30 years of wearing glasses. I mean, I got glasses when I was about eight and I was 38 by the time that, uh, by the time I discovered the Bates Methods and I had eight and a half diopter uh, glasses for myopia. And uh, and it, it was quite a discovery, uh, discovery for me. And so the, uh, the book kind of, um, in a sense, is, uh, is a time, tra- time travel project, uh, going back to my own childhood and giving myself the help that I would have needed <laughs> to, uh, to fix my eyesight or at least uh, have it more stable and not have to go so, so, so far um, and into myopia and then you know, take the long way back. Um, so I've, uh, I've been teaching the Bates method for 10 years now and about five years into, into my journey of, uh, eyesight improvement and teaching, um, I went to a workshop with, uh, Morena Bernardi, who's, uh, who's a Bates teacher, uh, from Italy and she works with, uh, Bates and music. And it was a really amazing workshop and you know, these, th- you know, these things. So she was thinking about creating, sh- creating a children's book herself. She never said it. But then I came out of the workshop and I had like the whole book in my head. I was like, I have this amazing idea. And I told it to her and to Maurizio Cagnoli, who is uh, also in the workshop. He was uh, uh, translating. And she said, but I I was thinking about writing a book. Um, And then, uh, and then I took a few more years to just uh, like, like four or five more years to, to actually finish it. Because books are sometimes, uh, they seem almost finished, but then there's a lot of things that you need to uh, work on. And um, yeah, it was really, really inspired by, by the stories of, uh, of children teaching each other the Bates method, which is something that I always found really beautiful in the stories, Emily's story for, from the clinic and also Bates' own stories about how children um, just learn the Bates method, and then they go ahead and teach their friends as a game because it's fun, because it's playful, because it's just something that's fun to do. And it's not, it's not like, um, it's not like homework. It's not, it's not heavy on you, you know? And so, um, 
maybe I think uh, maybe that's kind of my specialty. Although I think most Bates teachers could say could say this about myself, but I like to like play my way to better eyesight. So so with the the children, I I work with children, and I also work with children that are within adults, because <laughs> I think we all carry with us that child, especially especially people. Yeah with myopia um, who got um, glasses put on when they're kids, but also people with presbyopia that maybe have lost a little bit of that joy of play are really happy to rediscover their own ability to, to just be joyful and playful and curious and regain their eyesight that way. Because I mean, people come a lot of times like thinking, okay, I'm gonna do homework. I'm gonna improve my eyesight. It's gonna be hard. It's going to be boring, but I'm going to do it. And so it's it's sometimes long, but it's not hard or boring. It's usually fun. No. <laughs> yeah, and I love how you're able to kind of weave that that lesson into working with children in the sense of literally working with children, but also those inner children, um, so that it, it hits everybody because we've all got that inner child and. And you said that earlier, this, this book for you was almost kind of like a time travel thing of going back in time and, and wish, wishing that you had this book to read when you were younger. I, I've always thought that ever since I started practicing this, this work myself, that the Bates method can sort of act like this time travel device where, where it gives you an opportunity to go back to when you first got those glasses, or sometimes it just happens on its own, like some, some people will re, you know, some old memories will come up or you'll just be reconnected with some old feeling or this part of yourself that you haven't thought about in a while. And it, it's kind of neat how it, it, it allows you to sort of look at things or see things that you maybe haven't looked at or seen in a while. Right. Look at it and see exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You looked at for a while. I mean, even language has it, you know, integrated into it that uh, that we don't things that we don't want to see or that we don't want to look at, um, you know, kind of make our eyesight uh, <laughs> kind of uh, have problems in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Also, you know, the, the thing is, a lot of times, um, when people go back to to things in their childhood that were not okay. And I mean, I had a kind of rough time at school and luckily books existed. So I had somewhere to go, but you know, it was, it was not, school was not good for me. I was a really good student, but uh, socially it was difficult. And then, you know, my parents were having this nasty divorce and everything, but um, really, I think my parents did, did the best they could and even the school teachers did the best they could there's no one that i can say mm -hmm. they were not okay they were neglecting me or i was not taken care of i was totally taken care of but nobody had this information nobody had this idea that i might be having um a hard time they just thought that i couldn't see well and so they solved the problem by giving me glasses and that's the thing in a way that uh, that i would like this book to do if nothing else um, I would like people to know that, uh, that, uh, that eyesight problems is not just like a mechanical, um, physical, you know, thing that happens out of nowhere with no good reason, but rather that there always is a good reason and that, uh, that you can just, I don't know if not always resolve it because maybe, you know, maybe there was nothing to do about my situation in terms of, the, what was really going on, which was the divorce, which, which was, you know, um, my social skills at school, which were very limited. <laughs> um, but but just just to have, have someone know about this would have made a whole lot of difference to me. And that's that's kind of hidden in the book, but it's but it's in there. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure you found it. <laughs> oh, for sure. I did. I mean, I, I was so not only just flipping through the book and, and when I first got it and, and reading through it, was I just getting really excited and inspired. But then when I stumbled upon the section that, that actually did touch on the emotional component and, and, and how, and equipping these young people who are reading this book with tools and, and, and addressing this 
mental psychological connection with the eyes and the vision, I just started crying because it was just like, just like you said, I wish that I would have had this book when I was a little kid because it just hits on that that connection that I didn't realize until my adulthood when I found the Bates method and started exploring these connections. And it was just like this aha moment after aha moment of, of acknowledging those emotional connections with my, my visual development. So you did such a, such a good job of encapsulating this and, and guiding the reader through it in a way that it's very, very playful, like you said, and very, you know, it, it, it invites you to get up off your chair and, and stop reading and, and participate and do what it's talking about. It's very experiential. Um, and it also like gives, gives the kids permission to, to look at those less comfortable things as well in a really gentle way. So yeah, it just, you know, I, I got so excited when I was reading it the first time of just thinking the implications of, of what even just that one section is going to have on so many, so many kids' lives. Yeah. So, so that was, that was really important for me. And they're, they're like, um, I mean, the book is really, uh, they're games, they're, you know, things that you can, kids do them. They're, the kids really love the, love the, the games and they just look at the book and they go and they play. But then there are like these maybe three moments that, that are, that are like this, this moment of the emotional, um, like the emotional implication of, uh, of eyesight um, that were really important to me. And actually after the, the book came like all almost ready in that, in that one workshop with Morena Bernardi, um, I took all these years afterwards to just do that, just find the, this very subtle balance of these three moments. Yeah. And, and also maybe a little bit, um, you know, play with the characters, how much story I want or how much, how little story I want. The other moment that I really, um, that I really like and that, that I find is, was really hard to find the balance is the moment where, um, where the dad who's actually, I mean, I have the parents in the book, the book is child led, the children are teaching the method as, as in the, in the um, Bates stories. But I was really um, kind of worried that, that if the book goes just with kids and there's no parents there, then parents could kind of feel uh, um, that they can just give, give off the book to their kids and not be involved. And actually teaching kids, I find that often um, the most difficult part in teaching kids is their parents. Because parents um, who are totally well-meaning and want to do the best for their kids sometimes just um, just give bad example in the sense that they come with their kid and they're like, okay, fix the kid. I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm going to live with glasses. I can't, there's nothing to do for me. And so they're telling their child, I'm not going to do anything for me. So don't do anything for you. No, that's the, like the implicit lesson. And so the child's like, I want to be like mom. I want to be like dad. I'm not going to do this glasses thing if they're not going to do it. So that's like one thing that parents do that really um, makes the process difficult. And the other thing that the parents do is um, they're like, uh, okay, now, you know, do it. Uh, uh, take off your glasses. Do the, just like turn it sometimes, sometimes into homework, turn it into like a chore or something that's very demanding. Right. So, uh, so in order to kind of <laughs> avoid these things, um, I got the parents in the book. And so the, the dad has glasses. And, and in the third page of the book, um, Iris, who's the, who's the protagonist uh, who teaches the Bates method, uh, invites her friend uh, uh, Luke to take off his glasses and everyone to take off their glasses. And then uh, the little sister who's just there for the fun, she doesn't uh, need glasses, Lucy, she, she steals dad's glasses and is like, dad, come and play. And, gets him to come into the, to, to this thing and also to try. And even if, even if children are really much more flexible than adults and they can get results much faster, <laughs> um, even though adults may be slower in getting results, the fact that, that the parents are also going through it and playing and, you know, it's a family thing. It's not like, you know, your problem, your glasses, but it's like, well, let's all play. Um, that really helps make uh, make uh, uh, the process uh, successful. So, so that's why I have the parents in there. But then I wanted to address um, this this thing that that really it is 
more difficult for adults and they and we get frustrated because uh, um, you're like, okay, take off your glasses, but maybe it's really difficult and you have to work and you're like, you know, but I'm really stressed now. Uh, maybe I'll do it later. I don't have the time. And so there's this, this page in the book where, where the kids are like, they're not even saying anything. And dad is like, yeah, I wish I could, but I can't. And that, that for me is like, a, <laughs> is like a very important moment for parents. And I don't know, I don't know if parents will, will get it, right. but it's just like in the next image, um, they're just like walking, crossing or crossing a river. Um, and, and Iris is saying, you know, take it step by step. Don't, don't worry about like, you know, getting it all done, just do it when you can take off your glasses when you don't need them. No, that's, that's also something that I, that I say a lot to kids, take off your glasses when you don't need them. And then yeah. you have the liberty to decide when you need them and when you don't. I mean, sometimes emotionally you need glasses just to feel in control. Um, and sometimes you don't need them because really, you know, people, people think you need glasses, but you really don't need glasses. There's no such thing as you need glasses. Um, most people, or like most people, not all of them, but most people would not get run over by a car. I remember with eight and a half diopters, I could still cross the street and not get run over by a car. Mm -hmm. Most people have no tigers in the living room, no alligators before breakfast, you know, nothing dangerous in their house. So, so really, it's like, no, we, we need glasses, but it's an emotional need. No, it's like uh, we need glasses because we feel scared, because we feel um, insecure, because we feel we don't control everything. Um, and so, and so when, you, when you feel that feeling when, that you need glasses, you know, just put them on. But really, it's, it's interesting to note that it's not a survival thing. It's an emotional thing. We don't really, in, in our kind of protected world, we don't really need glasses. Right. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, I remember that transition or that adjustment of at first think like literally thinking, well, I can't, I can't function without them. I can't. And I really felt like I couldn't even think without them. Like I couldn't think straight, you know, if I couldn't, couldn't see clearly. And, and so it definitely was a process of, of coming to those realizations that you just shared of, wait a minute, I, okay, I can't tell what brand that car is, but I can tell that it's a moving thing and I'm not going to get hit by it. So it, it didn't take me very long to realize, you know, to kind of come around to really how I was so dependent on them for so long that I started to think it was a matter of, of life or death or, or survival. Um, so even just that recognition is, is, could be really powerful for a lot of people of acknowledging the type of need that it is and, uh, and then starting to think about when, when you need it, when you don't, but uh, I really appreciated you putting that section in there because there's such this momentum building throughout the book and then you do kind of hit that spot and it does feel like a little bit of a like a halt you know and and then and I think that's so important as opposed to just because that's such a common uh, feeling that people run into when they're starting to incorporate more of the Bates method into into their lives is hitting hitting a little patch of frustration or plateau where it doesn't seem like it's it's working like it was at the start or things are changing or you get really busy or you just get stressed out so I think that was really artful how you you crafted that in there as well I wanted to, I wanted to say about the thing that you said about um, not being able to think without your glasses you know there's there's some there's some teachers who say I you know what I uh, uh, his name slipped my mind, but uh, the teacher who worked a lot with psychology, he died last year, um, American teacher. Is, it, is he American? I'm not sure. Uh, Robert, Roberto Kaplan. Roberto Kaplan. That's a good one. And he, he said that actually you do your analytical thinking with uh, your central vision. And in that sense, glasses make you more analytical and um, they kind of dim out the, the, um, the feelings that actually work go more through the periphery. So maybe it is true that you can't, at least in the beginning, mm -hmm. think as clearly without your glasses. I don't know, I, didn't, I don't uh, remember that experience for me, but, uh, but I do remember um, a time when I was, uh, years before I started doing this, where I broke my glasses and had to cross um, 
Broadway Street in New York um, with my glasses, I, I certainly thought I would die. I thought I would not make it to the other side. But I mean, it was a crossroad. I could see the green light. I mean, other people were crossing. There was no way that I would physically die. <laughs> but that was my feeling. It was like terror. I was terrified. <laughs> I, got, I got to the other side of Broadway crying. <laughs> Yeah. So it really, it really does feel it's not, it's not, it's not untrue. It really feels like it's a survival thing. Mm -hmm. But once you start investigating, which is really the with adults, that's maybe the first thing I do. I'm, I'm like, okay, investigate when you use your glasses and just try to pay attention if you really need to see something sharply, or if it's if it's more an emotional um, crutch, more an emotional aid. No, and then and then people are like. Hmm. And they start noticing it, start noticing how they can actually um, walk to work without their glasses on, even take the bus without their glasses on. You can just put the glasses on to see if it's the right number or you can ask people. People are really nice about it. If you're like, excuse me, when, is that the 32 bus? And people would be like, no, you idiot. Can't you see? No, people would be like, yeah or no. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's wild how it, it sounds sounds silly when you say it out loud, but that is such a, a a fear in a lot of people when they go without their glasses of of that that voice you just did of you know people calling you out or, or making fun of you, and, and that can be kind of rooted, I think, in in some old old experience or memory or fear that that kind of lingers around. And I was going to ask you about your your Broadway Street experience um, when that was or how old you were at that time. Um, I was 28 and I was, uh, I was studying at NYU, something totally different, like from uh, some previous lifetime. I've had several, <laughs> yeah. uh, several uh, things that I did. Um, and uh, yeah, I was crossing from, I was crossing over to, to uh, NYU where I actually had the spare glasses in my locker. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, I was just going to say that like, it, it was that much of an emotional, you know, emotionally overwhelming experience at that age. And, and just putting that into context of, of just empathizing with, you know, a young, younger child, maybe going through a similar experience where unable to see clearly. And, you know, if you were in tears by the, the time you got across the road, but you, you had certain tools and, and things that you could handle that stress with, but you know, maybe a younger person wouldn't have the kind of tools to handle that. And then it kind of becomes this really important moment in, in their visual vision history or their vision story or their vision development from that, that moment on. And it's kind of interesting how uh, when these things happen at different times in life, it can really just affect us in, in such vastly different ways. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure it's, uh, I'm not sure it's actually true for children. I mean, for some, it is for sure. But a lot of times kids are happy to just go without glasses <clears throat> because, I mean, once you're used to the glasses, then, then you're like dependent. But before that, uh, people tend to think that what they see is just, you know, that's it. It's what they see and it's okay. So uh, a lot of times kids will be happy to play hours without glasses, see what they see, just experience what they experience. And it's their parents that are freaking out. Um, so not, not, I'm... A person who's not used to glasses would really not have that that experience. They would have the experience of, you know, seeing the blurry things come from this side as usual and the blurry things come from the other side and then just, you know, um, navigating because um, things like crossing the road that have to do with uh, with uh, uh, varying speeds, come, things coming at you are really much more a function of the peripheral vision than they are of central vision. You don't really need uh, clarity in order to, uh, it, I mean, you would have to be really, really um, deep into a, a visual problem in order to not see the cars, unless they were of a great distance, white cars, um, you would probably see them, you'd see them blurry, but you, you can, actually, you know, well, you know, glasses distort the, our appreciation of velocity because, uh, because um, we calculate how fast things are moving by the size of them, by how they grow in the visual field. So uh, once you put on the glasses, the, the minus glasses makes things look smaller, so further away, and the plus glasses make things look closer. 
So, so in a way, with the glasses, you're worse off to drive, to drive your bike, to appreciate distances, to play ball. And a lot of people have the experience of taking off the glasses and being better, better at sports after, after they figure out which direction they're going in. <laughs> but uh, yeah. um, so, so really, um, more than to say that a child would have this traumatic experience, I would say that any person that, who's already hooked on glasses would have that experience. A lot of, in a lot of cases, small children don't know that they have, they don't complain that they don't see. I mean, sometimes they do. And when you, when you, uh, when they say they don't see, they, they don't see. I mean, um, a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, but it happened to me sometimes that parents would come and say, um, she says she doesn't see, but I don't think it's true. Kids do, do not normally lie about this. It's not, uh, they don't make it up. If they don't see, they don't see. Um, but, but then a lot of other cases, kids just don't notice that they don't see. They're just happy the way it is. Like, I think I remember for myself when I was, I, I remember just walking around school at that period of time before the glasses and just hoping the world would just like take a step backwards. I just remember that phrase in my head. I was like, I wish the world would just like give me some more space, take a step, a step backwards. And then when my vision blurred, I don't know when it happened, I never noticed it. And someone came to school and tested the kids and that's how they found out that I was, uh, that I, that I was not seeing well. But I didn't um, notice any problems. If there's not a blackboard to say, everybody's seeing from the blackboard and you're not, then you can, you can totally be with blurry vision and not feel that it's not okay, because it's natural for you and also because blurry vision really um, feels natural. It's not, uh, as opposed to glasses that always feel kind of weird and you're always like, you have to get used to your glasses. Um, when it's your blur, it's, it's fine, it's, it's, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in the name, right? They're called artificial lenses. So they're, okay. they're sort of unnatural by nature. <laughs> Uh, right. and, and some people are better at, at getting used to them than others. You know, I've, I've definitely met some people who just never, especially when it comes to like multifocal lenses or bifocal lenses, uh, that those or, or even prisms and things like that can, can be quite difficult to adjust to and get used to. And, and I really appreciate you sharing that about how it, it warps space and uh, dimension, right? So the, the depth perception and the size of objects that that was I always remembered like the first pair of glasses it it was difficult to go up and down stairs because when I would look down it made my legs seem farther away and longer and it, it kind of messed with my whole spatial awareness at first and and something in my brain must have had to have changed and, and adapted to to compensate for that and so when I after doing that for years and years and years and then taking them off I didn't have the details that I had through the glasses, but all of a sudden I was connecting in with this more true depth and space and, and dimensionality and colors and periphery and everything. So uh, I've heard that recently too from some of my students where they're, uh, they're taking their glasses off before they play tennis um, and, and their, periphery vi their peripheral vision's better. They're hitting the ball more accurately, even though they might not be seeing their opponents shirt or, or face with as much detail as with the, the glasses or the contacts. But when we like that can be turned into like one of these vision games, like, you know, coming back to this idea of the book of turning the, the visual development of the visual vision improvement process into playing games. And at the very beginning, when you introduce that as one of the main, you know, core concepts or goals of your, your book, that, that really highlights one of the biggest kind of mistakes, I think, that people and, and parents maybe make when they're trying to improve their vision or get their kids to improve their vision is, like you've said today, kind of turning it into homework or just another kind of task or chore. So what, what would you say, like, if, if parents are listening to this right now, um, other than, you know, obviously checking out the book and, and getting some inspiration from that, um, what, what might you be able to like leave parents with today of maybe a, a tip or two or, or things that could kind of get them started on this journey in a way that in, in your eyes or in your experience, like 
has less mistakes, like not making mistakes or, or ways that's maybe going to work a little bit better, especially if maybe they've already kind of tried something, you know, to, to help their kids vision or their own vision. Yeah, I think uh, doing th things that are non demanding and creating a, an environment that's, that's non, um, that's criticism free, that's, uh, that's uh, accepting and where nothing is a mistake is the best environment to learn how to improve your eyesight. And it's also good for the parents who are always thinking that they're making mistakes or that they're doing a terrible job. <laughs> and, you know, even uh, our own parents who did a wonderful job, but still we got to wear glasses and to an adult age, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. You did, you did a great job. My, if my parents are listening, did a great job. <laughs> um, so the first thing I think is to take the weight off. Um, and even, you know, Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but life without glasses is not the end of the world. If you're really um, scared that your child will have glasses, you know, uh, don't be. It's okay. You could, people live with glasses and it's also good. It's also okay. And they will have the chance to decide when they're adults if they want to uh, go into this process and, and not wear glasses. So just the first, first thing I would do is just make it not so all important because sometimes people come and they feel that that it's terrible if their children have an eyesight problem and it's terrible if they have some emotional difficulties and just uh just i think uh, or it's terrible if they make a mistake as parents and you know they're gonna make mistakes everybody makes mistakes so just to take some weight off of that immediately take some weight off their children and helps their eyesight. So just, uh, you know, that, that in that weird way, uh, the harder you try, uh, the less, <laughs> the less it works. <laughs> um, so I would say after that, after being less demanding and less, uh, um, you know, uh, achievement or goal oriented, um, I would say time outside is very, very important. Um, just to spend time outside non-structured time is great just to hang out just to walk around just you know see what's out there um look at stuff and playing ball games is great as long as it's uh, not not um you know not a again not a very competitive demanding activity and nobody's making nobody's being made to feel that they're a loser or a failure if they can't hit the ball or if they're really mm, not so good at it and, uh, and then I think maybe uh, just looking far and looking up would be, uh, would be two important things. And they're much easier to do when you, go, when you go outside, actually, almost automatically, a lot of things that are really good for natural vision happen because yeah. um, um, you have all these distances that you can look at and you actually do because at home, you're kind of, you know, you have your walls and you have your ceiling kind of boring. You don't really pay a lot of attention to them. So that's there you're already in a box, you already lost some of your periphery. Mm -hmm. And um, blinking has to do with uh, changing of, uh, of um, focal distance. No, we kind of automatically blink when we change focal distance. So that happens outside very naturally because uh, everything's not at the same distance. And if you look up rather than down, which is what we do mostly, mm -hmm. um, then, then already, you know, you can look at the clouds, uh, you can look at birds, fly kites, um, blow, you know, soap bubbles, uh, throw balls, do stuff that, that goes up because we're really, um, we're really a close up downward looking society. We're always like, you know, with our nose in our little, little thing, even if it's a, you know, a book or drawing or a Lego, mm -hmm. which are also great. You can do it with, uh, with really no eye strain and they're wonderful things and kids love them and they're good for eyesight. But, uh, but going outside, yeah, that's, I think, the number one thing that, that I would say, to just go and hang out outside. And there's actually um, investigations that say that uh, the one thing that has most uh, power of preventing eyesight problems in children is two hours of outside, outdoors activity a day. So most of us are pretty far away from that, especially this year. <laughs> but um, yeah. Outside, yeah, go been, outside, that would be. Yeah, I, I, that's such a, a wonderful, all-encompassing tip because like you said, you know, I was kind of joking about it's in the name of glasses, they're called artificial lenses, they're sort of unnatural 
you know, the name of what we teach is called natural vision improvement, partly because just by going out in nature, a lot of the stuff gets taken care of for us. Like you said, that all the, the good vision habits sort of are baked into that time. And I've been reminding people about that two hours a day study that, you know, came out several years ago, but I, I don't know about you, but I feel like sometimes if, if the bar is too high, sometimes I feel like why even bother, you know, and I don't even make an effort to do it. And so I've been reminding myself and other people to like, at least strive for towards that two hours, even if you know, you're not going to hit that, you know, at least making those little changes and tweaks in your day to add five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 15 minutes there. And it, it does add up over, over the day. And uh, so, yeah, really appreciate that. And, and also that the whole thing you talked about, about maybe reducing or removing some of the pressure because in the better eyesight podcast, you and I were talking about how a lot of people are, problem oriented, problem solving oriented and pain motivated. So that a lot of people who take, cause people, uh, there was a story about the school children improving their vision a hundred years ago using the Bates method. And even the kids in the class who had apparently normal sight were seeing even sharper and better on the eye chart as well. So we were just kind of talking about how can we get more people who already have quote normal vision to use the Bates method to make their vision even better than it already is. And we were saying that, well, people usually wait until something goes wrong before they look into ways that can, can fix it. So not only are people very problem oriented like that with themselves, but I know that parents are definitely very, can, can be very problem oriented with their kids. Like, like you said, they're like, don't worry about me and my, my messed up vision or whatever, like save the kid. Save the kid. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, And and parents are are so, you know, they'll, they'll put everything Uh, you know, everything, it doesn't matter about themselves, it's about the kids. So that can translate into a lot of pressure sometimes on the kid, I think, Uh, feeling like, oh, this is really important. You know, I don't want to let my parents down. Right. And what, when you said that maybe it's about waiting, you know, letting the child wear the glasses for five, 10, 15 years, whatever, and let them get to a point in their life where they make the decision that, you know what, I do want to look into this Bates method thing. And if they get to that point later in their life when they're an adult and, and they, somebody talk, you know, they find this podcast or somebody mentions something about vision and they have this bad memory from childhood about, you know, their parents pressuring them to do these eye exercises and this thing they didn't really like or understand or have fun with, then they're probably less likely to do it later on in life <laughs> you know, when they're, you know, making that decision for themselves versus if they just remember reading this really, you know, beautiful book and, and playing with their, their siblings and classmates and parents with it, even if they don't, you know, fully go with it a, as a young kid, they'll at least have this, you know, positive memory with it. And then they'll maybe be more inclined to, uh, to revisit it later on in life. That's kind of cool to think about these little memories that are, are forming in the kids that are that are reading your book um, already so yeah I, I, I want to say two things about that one is that uh, I'd like to add to the first tip a second tip which is only use glasses when you need them don't tell your kids to put your glasses on so then uh, if you do that then these five ten years even if they don't improve and they don't do the they don't want to play the games um, and you're not pressuring them and you're just like, okay, just don't, you know, put your glasses whenever you want and kids will self-regulate. And in a lot of cases, either stay with a, with a much lower uh, vision problem, which is much easier to solve or kind of spontaneously not need the glasses anymore. And this is, this is, um, <laughs> also something that, uh, um, I have like my own little statistic about, um, natural vision being really natural. Uh, people are like, um, the Bates method. I've never heard of it. It doesn't work. I don't know anyone who, who's done that. And actually, I think that everyone knows someone in the world who regained their eyesight naturally, normally by not using glasses. It's just someone in your family or, you know, next, uh, next Christmas meal, ask everyone or next, uh, uh, you know, uh, work meeting, ask everyone who was prescribed once glasses just decided to not wear them and doesn't need them. Because a lot of people at some point, kids for sure, um, 
go get that test. Someone comes to school, they're stressed, they don't do well. Someone prescribes glasses and they're just like, um, you know, I'll just eat that little note for my parents and never show it to them. <laughs> or I'll just, you know, I'll just, uh, for people with presbyopia who are like, okay, that's it, you're done with your eyes, I'm sorry, here are your uh, glasses. And people are like, um, no, no, I don't think so. And then in a year or two, it just passes. So, so that's one thing that happens when you're not like super worried about the glasses. And uh, a lot of kids uh, whose parents came to me uh, and said, oh, that he was prescribed glasses. And I was just like, yeah, tell him to use them when he needs to. Uh, and then the kids will put them on to see the blackboards if they feel they need it or, you know, just do something else during school, which is okay. Uh, <laughs> um, and then go play sports without them. And I'll have this like pressure of glasses that are, you know, this like really delicate, not child friendly thing that you can sit on, step on, forget in all sorts of places. And it's like this responsibility, your glasses, don't forget your glasses, put on your glasses. And if you don't have that, you're just like, oh, I can't see well, put the things on and just like, oh no, I'm fine. I don't want to put them on. And, and it just kind of the problem can go away. And the other thing that I wanted to say about what you said is that really there's a part that's just having the information which makes you have the choice. So right now, or when I was a kid, there was no choice for my parents. Nobody said, okay, you can put on the glasses or you can just wait and see what happens or you can you know, talk to her and see what's going on or whatever. Um, but they were like, no, there's an eye problem. She needs glasses. She needs glasses. Okay. If she needs glasses, we're going to get her glasses. How are we going to leave the child without, without what she needs? It's like the body has developed a need for glasses. <laughs> so um, once you have this idea that this exists, just like the mere, you know, information, just knowing there are some people who say that eyes can cure themselves like any other part of the body cures itself, which is rather <laughs> normal, you know, if you fall, you know, bend your whatever, it goes back into place, you hurt your knee, it heals. So the eyes, okay. So you're like, okay, somebody says this is possible. And just with that information, you have choice. You're like, I'm gonna look into it. No, I don't, I don't want, I'm not gonna look into it. I'm gonna go the traditional way and go to the eye doctor. And so many parents nowadays are interested in alternative medicine, and natural ways of doing things and other ways of educating. But really, there's so little information about, about what we do that, uh, that you find all these uh, people who are trying to do things as natural as possible and then wear glasses. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny. I think uh, I went to this, um, I did this course that was somehow got to the, to the, to the knowledge of these like hunter-gatherer people who did these like uh, walks in nature of like three days, just eating what they found. I yeah. think no clothes on, but just glasses. <laughs> so so would, they would be just like, you know, walking around in nature, <laughs> eating the things they found with their glasses on. And, and then all of a sudden I got this course, it was full of them. So one of them found out about me and they just like, like all came, they were like, we don't want to wear the glasses to, to our, totally natural walk in nature where we want to feel connected and it was really beautiful but but it's so they somehow managed to make glasses so natural and almost like a beauty thing you're like oh my Dolce Gavana glasses is just like like an ornament and it's really like uh, uh, strange in a way but I think just like this information just the people know that this exists gives them a choice and then from this choice they can you know, choose. They can do whatever they want. And the kids can choose and the parents can choose. And I think all choices are fine. Maybe, you know, maybe now is not your moment to uh, take off your glasses, but just, just know that it's possible and that other people are doing it. Doesn't mean you have to, just means you can. Yeah, I think that's key, that word choice there, because that, that's what I've always been really passionate about is whether or not people decide to pursue this work and try it themselves or experiment with, with natural vision improvement is not what I'm as concerned with. I'm most concerned with the, with providing people with the choice that they get 
they get at least aware that this exists and that it, it's an option to explore if you'd like. Um, I, I just want to provide people with that option to make that choice. And the other sort of interpretation of that word choice is also coming back to the kids and, and with the parents too, is, is maybe one thing that could help is, is leaving, like, like we've been talking about, leaving this as a choice for the child. So it doesn't feel like they're choiceless. And this is just something that's being forced upon them by parents or teachers or adults but it's being shared with them and presented as a choice. Hey, this exists. Do you want, do you, do you want to read this book with me? Do you want to try this vision game with me? And, and that's, it's a choice that they get to make. And then they're kind of more, you know, in, in charge, so to speak. And yeah, I, totally. I also just think it's very interesting that uh, I, in high school, did have a pair of Dolce & Gabbana glasses. <laughs> I, I don't know it's I don't remember the, the the names but the glasses were the thing that I would spend the most money on because yeah. they, they were the one thing that I would that I would you know it was always on me so mm -hmm. they, they had to be the most beautiful ones and you know with the eight and a half diopter lenses they're really, like thick um, they would have to be the thinnest lenses the, the least noticeable mm -hmm. and uh, I remember one day I stepped on my glasses I was uh, 30 something already pretty close to my Bates period yeah. And boy, did I cry. I was mm. like, oh no, so much money in the glasses yeah, yeah. that I liked so much. It was terrible. <laughs> well, and I'm glad you brought that up again too, of, of just like coming back to your own journey and your own experience with this as people look into your work and, and hopefully check out the book. Um, I think it's really cool just to kind of hear about your personal journey with this. And, you know, when I, when I started, I was around like minus four with my myopia, with astigmatism as well. Um, and it was a multiple year process with several kind of, you know, step down weaker glasses and things. So did you want to just share briefly a little bit about your transition, you know, cause, cause you had worn glasses for longer than I had and you were, had a higher starting prescription than me. And so what, what was that whole, uh, just as we start to kind of wrap things up, um, there might be some interesting little insights in there for, for the listeners as well. Right. So first of all, I have to say that I do not have glasses. I do not use glasses, but I don't see perfectly yet. So I'm still on the journey. So I'm, um, I guess I, d I didn't actually go to measure it, but by comparison, I would say I'm between two, two day after and zero, depending on the moment of day. Um, I don't see perfectly. And when I, when I use the computer, for instance, I sometimes use pinhole glasses. Um, so, uh, so, uh, just in terms of, you know, uh, being perfect, mm, not didn't happen yet, but I'm still, I'm still on my way. My journey started, uh, before, before the eyesight, I was, um, I had some back problems and, um, and I started, uh, I started going to an osteopath and studying with her because I was very interested And then, and I studied with her and I learned that, uh, that the body can heal itself. And then, and then one day I wondered if the body can heal itself, what are the eyes? Because she had some glasses on and I had some glasses on. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder why, why this one part of the body, which is even this really, um, really important uh, doorway that expresses us and re that receives the world and, and expresses our in inner world or maybe the other way around, maybe what we see is our inner world. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I was like, why, why is that not healing itself? And I was like, yeah, of course, it's not healing itself because of uh, the things, the glasses. We're not, I'm not giving it a chance to heal itself. Yeah. And, uh, and then that was the first time I thought about it and started wondering why, uh, why um, after healing my back and seeing so many other things heal, um, why, why is nobody asking the question about the, about the glasses? And then, um, finally I had to, I had this, uh, moment of, uh, <laughs> uh, moments, very important moment where I downloaded a 700 page book on my computer and read it during like a whole really hot summer night in Barcelona. Um, and by the time it was like three or 4am, cause I'm sort of book addicted, um, 
<laughs> by the time it was three o'clock in the morning or four, my contact lenses felt really uncomfortable. <laughs> so I wanted to take them out. But, uh, but then I went to the bathroom and there was like a huge, very scary cockroach there. And I had to, you know, retreat and decide to uh, do what, uh, what was always a bad idea, but it always worked for me, which is sleep with my contact lenses <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. after I finished the book. So I finished the book, 700 pages in one night. It was not really a good book. Um, and then I went to sleep with my contact lenses in and in the morning, I could hardly open my eyes. I just had to like kind of peel the contact, contact lenses out. They were like, had this cornflakes like texture um, and I could hardly open my eyes. I had to phone a friend to like come and get me and go to the pharmacy. I had really conjunctivitis. And then I was stuck in Barcelona for about a week uh, without being able to open my eyes to just like lie on the sofa and think, what are the things that I like to do that have no eyesight needed for them? Right. And I was like, right, maybe you should take a better look at that, you know, idea that you had about healing the eyes because you really like seeing. So <laughs> that was my big moment of revelation. And then, and then I started looking and found the Bates School. So that's, yeah, it's a, it's a little <laughs> bit of a horror story, but it, I think sometimes we have to have those experiences to really, like we, we mentioned earlier, kind of this problem solving oriented, uh, you know, kind of getting scared into the fact that, wow, this, you know, this is something that's super important to me and I, and I don't want to take it for granted. And, and that's the beautiful thing about the Bates method is it just lays out this blueprint of, it's like a user manual for the eyes of, of how to care for them and, and preserve them and make sure that they're healthy and happy and youthful. And uh, sounds like you've been integrating that ever since and, and really uh, embracing that in your life and not only for yourself, but sharing it with others and teaching it now in the form of the book, it's, uh, it's just really, really special. Mm. And I wanted to say the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say about my journey is that uh, I did reduce my glasses a few times, uh, kind of uh, maybe uh, in the beginning, uh, kind of wildly. Um, and, then, and then afterwards, I would just reduce my glasses because, uh, because my eyes wouldn't take them. They just didn't, want, they, I would just get, get headaches. Yeah. Um, and so after not so many years, uh, I had this one experience of going to the airport and I'd forgotten my glasses. And that was really like a very stressful situation. I mean, not as stressful as it is now, but it's are very complicated. And, and I was like, oh no, I'm without my glasses. How will I, how will I get through this? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then there was this like line for the password and there was this guy with glasses and he just like asked everyone, excuse me, excuse me, I'm getting, I'm getting late. Da, 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 da. And he got to the passport control. Everybody let him pass. And then he turned back because it turned out he was in the wrong place. And I was like, you know, with glasses or without glasses, you can always be under that stress and be in the wrong place. And I'm just gonna take my time without my glasses just to ask where I need to be. And if I can navigate an airport, then I don't need glasses anymore. And I did navigate that airport. And um, I think I never used glasses since. That was, uh, that was quite a few years ago. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love it's a very real experience to live without glasses when, when vision is not totally clear because you're really in touch with um, how you're feeling. So it's very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it, you know, it takes a special kind of person. It takes a certain level of, of uh, courage and self-confidence. And, and I love how so many of your stories also uh, emphasize community as well. And I know that when we experience a vision problem and when we experience blur, sometimes that can feel kind of isolating or like we're alone. And so for you to share these examples of, um, you know, reaching out and just seeking help and a asking someone a question next to you or, you know, like people are, are for the most part, friendly and, and willing to help and want to assist. And so that that's a really powerful reminder um, to, to just remind people that, it, it, that was a lesson I had to learn when I broke my ankle and I was on crutches. I had to learn how to ask for help. I was so uncomfortable with it because I wanted to be so self, you know, independent and, and not relying on others. And so I had to start asking, Hey, could you open that door for me? Could you hold that, hold this while I get over to the table or whatever, and just strangers. And, and everybody was so friendly and helpful. And, and so we, 
you know, we, we're able to do that with our eyes too. So I, I appreciate you sharing some of those, those tidbits along the way as well too today. You know, the, the, we're always interdependent, especially when you're very young and when you get to very old, we always need some help. But in, in the middle, we're kind of like, uh, oh, no, I don't need anyone. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, good to, it's good to remember that we always uh, need other people. And actually, um, yeah, other people make things mean things, you know, that we're always looking at other people. And uh, our world in a, in, in a very large sense is created by other people's vision or other people's, you know, presence. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> That's beautiful. And uh, I think that might be a good, good place to wrap things up because uh, it's been really amazing sharing this space with you today and sharing this conversation and sharing this vision together uh, overseas. And uh, I've been really looking forward to uh, having this chat with you today ever since I got your book in the mail. And also I, I got the book just right before I was moving. And so I was also really looking forward to using this as like my first interview in this new place. Was, was it your birthday when you got the book? I think it was. Yeah, it was right at the end of May there. Was, when, I, when I sent the book, I was gonna, I was gonna say, it's a birthday present. But then I was like, you know, why do you think these weird things? And then, <laughs> and then it was really your birthday. And I was like, Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was perfect. It was perfect. Such an important addition to my my library here, my, my bookshelf. So I'm excited to set up the new new library here at, at the new place. And uh, and I've I've been recommending how to improve your child's eyesight naturally by Janet Goodrich for many years now, you know, which which I still am going to do, but I'm now I'm super so excited. Uh, to have to have yours to recommend to parents and teachers and adults and so once again do you want to let people know uh, where they can find the book or, and just learn more about your work in general well information about the book uh, and how to get it will be on icclearly.org and then if you want to find out more about me you can look into my website which is uh, oritojos.com uh, slash eng which is for English, but uh, Orit Ojos is Orit Eyes. Somehow that worked out really well in Spanish. <laughs> um, O-R-I-T-O-J-O-S dot com. So that's, wh that's where you can find me. <laughs> awesome. And I'll make sure to add the links in, in the description and the show notes and everything like that. So definitely check out the website, check out the book. And thank you to everybody who's been listening and subscribing and sharing. Once again, now, now that I'm set up here at my new space. I'll be kind of getting back into the rhythm of, of releasing more regular episodes and interviews. So thank you, Orit, for being here with me today. And yeah, thank uh, you. if people haven't listened already, check out our episode of the Better Eyesight podcast for the August 1921 edition uh, to go even deeper into these practical ways that kids can help their vision at all ages. So. Yeah. And I want to say thank you, Nathan, for doing these podcasts that get the word out, because I think that's such an important part of our work, um, just to let people know that this is uh, that this is possible and available. And there are many ways to do it. So thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure. You're so welcome. And uh, yeah, like like I said uh, the other day, you know, I could talk about this stuff all day. And oftentimes I do. And it makes me really happy. So. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, thank you so much again for being here. And well, thank you for uh, having me. And we'll check in with the listeners again next month. Awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.